This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Pay need all who enter the podcast domain. That's right, folks. It's the Pay Heed Podcast, the first episode. I'm Nick Springer. I've got my great friend and expert analyst, Kevin Flirty, with me here. Kevin, man, I am so pumped up about the show. Uh, I'm just excited to be here with you. I'm excited for you to expand your knowledge while I sit here and pretend like I know something. I don't know. We'll see. But no, I, I think you're gonna have. Uh, I think you're gonna have more than enough to add. That's that's a tough intro to to live up to, though. I, I hope we can do it. Absolutely. On this podcast, we're going to be covering all things KU sports, KU athletics, right here on the Kansas City Sports Network. And we are brought to you by M Prize Bank on the podcast here, as always, member FDIC. And uh, yeah, we've got KU football, KU basketball, all things happening. And you'll find it right here on your Kansas City Sports Network feeds. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and follow us wherever you can to hear more from myself and Kevin. So Kevin, for our first episode, and we got a lot to get to. I mean, it's the offseason for KU basketball, but it sure doesn't feel like it with everything that they're doing right now involving the spring transfer portal. Uh, they just got a big commitment from AJ Store. They've added a couple of commitments already. They have three transfer portal commitments already. I was looking back, Kevin, you know, Hunter Dickinson didn't commit until late in May. So Kansas, they are really going full court press here in the transfer portal right now this spring. Well, yeah, when you think about the fact they've got three in the boat already and they aren't finished yet, you know, the fact is, is that we could wind up hearing relatively soon uh, on another potential transfer and, and he's not the only one that, that they're looking at it. And so there's a possibility here that you and I could be coming back to this show later this month and talking about how Kansas added five April transfers and, and you know, something that, like you said, from a calendar standpoint, is it, just almost almost shocking. I mean, it, you aren't used to to having that, that sort of thing, and you aren't used to it from Bill Self necessarily, not that he hasn't utilized the the transfer portal, but I'm not sure he's utilized it to this extent where you're, you're bringing in all of these guys that, you know, are not just, you know, Hey, this guy could fill a role, but you know, in a lot of the cases, these are guys that have star potential, you know, have starred previously. And, you know, two of the commits are, are, and potentially another one are, are coming from major conferences and teams that teams that won games. And so I think that's going to be, that's one of the main differences so far. What, what's what been sort of your main takeaway from from the accelerated <laughs> Bill yeah. Self and the transfer portal? Yeah, I think my biggest takeaway is, is kind of something you touched on, which is you look back at the way they approached the portal last season, and it was, hey, all or nothing, big fish or nothing, right? Guys like Hunter Dickinson, even in Arterio Morris, which didn't obviously pan out, but they were going after some of the big fish. And I think this year it was more of a, hey, we just need to go out and get guys. You know, we saw what happened with Katie at the end of the season this this past year where Kevin McCauley gets hurt and there just wasn't anything off the bench to really help KU at all down the stretch. And that really, really sunk them. So I think this emphasis on depth, you know, you think about a guy like Riley Kugel that KU added, you know, even at the time that they added him, I was like, man, is this guy really going to be somebody that's going to end up starting? I don't know. And now it's clear that he's probably going to be a bench depth piece, but a bench depth piece with real NBA upside. And that's something KU did not have this past season. So yeah, uh, the thing about Bill Self, Kevin, is that Generally, when he makes bold statements about what he's going to do, he tends to follow through. So when he says things like, we need to live in the portal, we're going to go get aggressive, we're going to get more athletic, so on and so forth, he tends to come through. And, uh, you know, the moniker Spring Bill has generally been applied to, you know, getting guys in high school, but now it's even more significant now with the transfer portal as well. Yeah, and you have to love the uh, the war chest that he's operating with as well, because we, we know obviously that, NIL is a, a big part of, you know, faring well in the transfer portal. But yeah, I, I think when you look back, it's not that Self has had a lot of seasons where, you know, they've struggled and his struggles in quotation marks are different than pretty much every other coach's because he's still, you know, finishing as a top four seed. He's still winning 20 plus games at, and all of those things. But you look at, you know, the 2018-2019 the team that didn't win the Big 12 and you know, there were some good reasons for that. The Yudoka Azubuki injury, you know, you, you wound up with a starting lineup that had three freshmen starting, basically. Um, and he fixed some of those issues, one of which was, you know, bringing Dope back healthy. But, you know, you, then, then you look at 2020, 2021, and it was kind of a flawed team. They lose by a lot to USC in that second round game. And Self says right there in the postgame press conference, 
hey, we got to get, you know, bigger, stronger, more athletic. They didn't really add a ton, but somehow they they wound up, you know, filling the holes that needed to be filled. Remy Martin really filled that extra scoring boost that that they needed guys to develop. Christian Brown was an entirely different player in 2021, 2022 than he was the previous year. And so Bill Self is one of those guys, I don't know if you would call it really added motivation, but I think that it's the sort of thing that when he has flaws that he can see and he can dissect, he's been really able to adjust and attack those things. And you look at the guys they've got already, the guys that they're continuing to recruit, I think one of the areas that he diagnosed that where he said, hey, we got to get better here, is not just depth, but depth of guys who can put the ball in the basket. Yeah, and, and what I love, especially about what's been happening with KU this season, is I love that we're that KU is going out and, and adding some of these types of players while still maintaining a core. You know, I think that's really important. Yeah. As much as bringing in new guys is great and going on the transfer portal, and you know, it's fun to see flashy names and think, oh gosh, what would that look like on KU? So on and so forth. At the end of the day, I think. Equally as important is bringing back a, a core of players, right? And you look at Kansas, or got to have three starters back with Hunter Dickinson, uh, Dewan Harris, and KJ Adams. So I, I love having that core still while then bringing in pieces that can augment it. Because I still think, even in this era of the transfer portal, this era of going out and getting guys left and right, you still look at. I mean, UConn's a great example. They have a, a, some cores, a core of players that have that have been in the program for a couple of years that have helped kind of build together. So I think that's still very, very important, and I love that KU is still maintaining that right now with the roster they currently have while bringing in guys that can augment those pieces. Yeah, do you know the last national champion that won without bringing back at least three players who started multiple games the previous season? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, obviously not UConn. Kansas, obviously. Uh, it, it's way back. Like, we're going to be on this show forever if you start counting back. Oh, it's, it's, it's 1997 Arizona. Wow. So that's how important it is to bring back that core. And, and, you know, obviously there's, you know, that's kind of a weird way to, to phrase it. There have been some teams that have returned basically two starters and then a third guy who literally started like two games. But but at the same time, you know, that guy's still part of your core. And, and so bringing back guys like that is kind of why, you know, if you follow KU Twitter or whatever else, you know, there's there's some angst about, hey, you know, are we going to roll with Dewan Harris some more? You know, is KJ Adams going to have the role that that he's had and things like that? Guys tend to improve from year to year. You're not even if you bring back the same four guys, they're not going to be the exact same way that they are this year, next year. And so, even beyond that, having that core of guys that when you have transfers, when you add in freshmen, guys who know where you know trading table is located, they know you know things about practice, and that's not even counting the bigger stuff, like the culture of a program and things like that. Having that institutional knowledge coming back, I think, is a major benefit to you. Yeah, and one thing I'm really excited about is when you look at Hunter Dickinson and how often he was being double team, triple team, sure. some of the guys that KU's had in the transfer portal that are capable from the perimeter should actually help him improve even more, right? I mean, this is a guy that's a second-team All-American, you know, average 18 and 11 last season, and it feels like he has a chance to maybe improve more if there's more guys around him that are able to create, that should open things up to where teams can't really isolate him as much as maybe they did this past season. Yeah, and the overwhelming number of transfers get better in their second year at their at their new home. And, and so you look at, at Kevin McCuller, right? Like Kevin McCuller, I feel like in his first year, was pretty similar to what he was at Texas Tech, and, and that was a really good basketball player. This year, you know, at least before he got hurt, he was on all your midseason first team All America teams and, and everything else. And, and so, those guys who stick around multiple years as transfers do tend to to make a jump too. But I, I agree with you. The biggest thing that could help Hunter Dickinson is having guys around him who can space the floor. And so, I, I think Dickinson was actually depended on some for that spacing at least early on. You know, with he and KJ Adams, you look at the UConn game in particular, you know, he hits three three pointers, I think. And, you know, KJ Adams has a big game because Donovan Klingon has to step away from the basket just in case, you know, Dickinson is going out there to shoot. Now you have some guys where you can run out some lineups where Dickinson can do kind of what he does best, too, which is score in the interior. And if guys dive down, if they, you know, 
if they try to help, you have guys that, that can punish them. And I, I think one of the interesting things about it, and it was actually brought up by friend of the show, Derek Johnson, but, you know, <laughs> shout out Derek. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Derek. You know, one of the things about these guys that they've already brought in is that they, those three by themselves have hit more 25 plus foot three pointers than the entire Kansas team did last year. So I'm not saying you want guys pulling up from 25 feet all the time. <laughs> But what I am saying is when you not only have gravity to stretch to the three-point line, but even beyond it, that's only going to create more room for guys that want to operate inside, whether that's Hunter Dickinson or whether that's even running pick and roll with K.J. Adams or things like that. I, I think another guy that could benefit from this, to be honest with you, is Dewan Harris because I think a lot of the times that he drove into the lane this year, the lane had about 35 people in it. It was hard to find a pass. It was hard to find a great look at the rim. You saw his sh- his shooting percentages at the rim really drop off this year. I think if they're able to space, a lot of the complaints maybe that people have about DeJuan Harris, some of those maybe get pushed to the side a little bit. Absolutely. Let's dive into more specifically the transfers that KU has already added right after this break. First, got to tell you about our partners at Home Field Apparel. They've got over 40 different KU designs, including a KU basketball shooting shirt, Kevin, I don't know about you, but I, I wear the key basketball shooting shirt to my wedding at this point. I mean, I think it's <laughs> awesome. Uh, I am rocking a Kansas City Sports Network shirt right now. Got a gun to go. me to start the podcast, but I do have some great home field uh, shirts of my own that I'm sure you'll be seeing me wearing uh, on this show. So if you haven't got a chance to check out Home Field Apparel, I've actually also, Kevin, I've got my Youngstown State football shirt on the way from Home Field to represent my guy Dylan Woodkey. Uh, so when we talk football, I might have to bust that one out. When I did, but it's so funny you say that because I'm not sure I have a home field Kansas shirt yet, but I actually have a home field two lane shirt with the one with the angry green wave. I, I love that thing. It, it's fantastic. And that's the beauty of home field. They've got over 140 other different schools that you can choose from. Uh, but if you're a Kansas fan and you haven't checked out home field apparel yet, do so. And if you are a first time shopper, you can use code KCSN23 to get a discount off of your first order. That's at homefieldapparel.com. We'll be back talking more KU basketball right after this. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. All right, welcome back into the Pay Heed podcast. I'm Nick Springer with my good friend, Kevin Flaherty, where you can find all of your great KU coverage from us right here on the Kansas City Sports Network. So be sure to subscribe, subscribe wherever you're watching or listening on YouTube or on wherever you're getting your podcasts. Uh, I had some more conversation there early before the break about the transfer portal for KU. All right, let's dive a little bit more specifically into it. KU has three transfers already committed out of the transfer portal. Let's go chronologically here. We'll start with Riley Kugel, who committed to KU uh, last month out of Florida. A transfer uh, spent two years at Florida was a, a Big Twelve, a, excuse me, SEC uh, All Freshman Team guy his freshman year. Last year dipped a little bit in production, but certainly I think has some NBA upside. What did you like about the addition of Riley Kugel initially when KU first uh, first got on the floor? Yeah. yeah, he was a guy that didn't really have the year that he was planning on, but when you looked at when you looked at where he was coming out of his freshman year, the last ten games of his freshman year. He averaged, I think, 17.3 points per game. He made almost 40% of his three-pointers. And there were people who were tracking him as a first-round NBA draft pick. Like he, They felt like he had that, that potential. He did have a down year this year. And, and so, you know, a lot of times when that happens, you, you need a fresh start. You know, he did struggle as a shooter, although it came back around later in the year. I think he hit, you know... He wound up shooting around 40% from three in SEC play. But at the same time, a guy like this is is somebody that I think Kansas really needed this year, something you and I have talked a lot about. Everybody wanted to blame the lack of shooting on this year's woes, and that was a big part of it, obviously. I thought one of the things that really hurt them as well was not having guys who could go and get their own shot. You know, the defense – has held for you know 20 seconds and now you need somebody to go create a look and, and Riley Kugel he's a tough shot taker he's a tough shot maker sometimes you know he's got a little bit of that 
Remy Martin trait in him and that the defense can be right there, have a great contest, and and he hits a step back shot anyway. Um, and, and so I think, you know, when you when you look at this year's team and, and kind of where he where he projects, you know, you, you talked about when he came in, you wondered, hey, is is this guy gonna start? He may or he may not, you know, he'll have a chance to compete for that. But where I would really like him is I think filling sort of that instant offense role off the bench, a guy who can come in and, you know, kind of change the complexion of a game because he hits a few shots. I also think, you know, people are going to look at the three point percentage and say, Oh, he, you know, here's another guy that, that maybe isn't a great shooter. I, I think it's could be a little bit different because he's going to be taking different kinds of, of outside shots at, at Kansas. You know, it was very seldom a, I'm going to get set, catch this thing in rhythm and, and take it. It was more of a, I'm going to try and clear room off the bounce and, and take this shot. And so I do think there's room for him to increase his efficiency as well. What were, what was the main thing that jumped out to you when, when they got this guy? Great athlete too. Really good. Athlete. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that jumped out to me, Kevin, was this. Nobody believes in Bill Self's coaching ability more than Bill Self. That was my takeaway <laughs> because you look at you look at Riley Kugel and you can see, as you mentioned it, I mean, this is a guy that has a legit NBA upside and a guy that, you know, towards the end of his freshman year at Florida, you saw some of that and that's what got him on draft boards, right? And then you look at it, what he did this past season and then things dipped a little bit, he struggled a little bit, but certainly that potential is still there. And I think this is a player where Bill Self looked at him and said, I can get the best out of this guy. I can get into that NBA upside and that's why that's why he's coming to KU. And so that was my big takeaway was Bill Self was looking at this guy saying, I could get that, I could get that back out of him, what we got from him, uh, what Florida got from him during his freshman year. Uh, because I think to your point, he's a great offensive threat and could be a really great athlete as well that Kansas could use off the bench. And uh, at 6'5", I think he's a guy that probably could move around a little bit, right? That seems to be something else when we get to talk about AJ Store too, we'll probably get more into that. But, you know, having the ability to switch, having the ability to play different positions is probably going to be a big for Kugel as well because he's probably going to be asked to play in a lot of different lineups uh, coming into this team. So, yeah, I, I think he's a great addition as well. I think he's a guy that, again, I like what kind of you said about him, which is coming off the bench and maybe being an offensive guy. I don't know how well he would be as a starter, but, you know, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for him as well. So, yeah, my big takeaway was Bill Self, he thinks that he can get the best out of anybody. And that's, I think, what we got here with Riley Kugel. Yeah, I think too, you know, some of these guys, and we'll get to some of the other ones, you know, maybe the the defense hasn't been there just yet, at least as an actualized product, right? You look at somebody like Kugel and you say, okay, with with his body, with his athleticism, like he should be a good defender. He just, right now, he he isn't. But one of the things that, that I think you'll find is a truism across college basketball is that the easiest way to make somebody defend is by putting them on the bench when they don't. And Bill Self is going to have, with all of these guys, he's going to have options. And so guys that haven't defended at the highest level, whatever, I think Bill Self is a really good defensive coach in general. So I think that will help. But even beyond that, guys who don't defend because maybe they're indifferent defenders, you know, are, are going to have a lot of incentive to defend when there's a really good guy you know, right behind you that's that's ready and willing to play if you don't defend. Yeah, I think it's interesting. When you look at the teams that made the Final Four, like Alabama, for instance. Sure. Near 100 in Ken Paul on defense, which is just insane to think about. They make the Final Four, but with the, with the style that they played, they were able to score enough. I wonder if Kansas is going to maybe not so much geared to that extreme. That's obviously the more sure. extreme, but maybe they are saying, hey, with Bill Self, let's put together a team where we can go out and score a lot to where maybe we don't have to rely as heavily on our defense. But I, I'm sure you know better than everybody, Kevin, that Bill Self loves his defense. So I know he still wants to make sure that he doesn't give up baskets. Yeah, for sure. And so I do think when we look at this group as a whole, and obviously we'll get into the other guys, but when we look at this group as a whole, I think defense is a little bit of a question mark when you look at how, ever, how, how all the pieces are going to fit together. Um, and so I, I think that that's going to be something to that's going to need to be figured out is what's the group that can defend, what's the group that can close games out where you have a lead and and you can have guys in that you know defend well because Bill Self has shown, hey, if it's the final minute and we need to get stops, he is willing to make an offense for defense sub to to get a guy in there who who can go get a stop for him, and so. 
I, I'm with you in that I, I think Bill Self has seen, you know, perfect offense beats great defense every time. You know, you can get a great contest hand in the guy's face and, and he just makes a shot and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, Alabama plays such a, you know, fast pace, you know, spread, you know, launch shots. And I don't think, like you said, I don't think that that's going to be what Kansas is going to be, but I do think that Self has seen and and, you know i'm I'm not acting like he just discovered it but i I think that he's noticed that hey there's there's a pretty good path out there when you have a lot of guys that can score and moving into the second guy that kansas got out of the transfer portal in this spring window that's none other than a lawrence kid lawrence lion z cameo commits to kansas as well Uh, i thought it was really cool that he had the pictures in his commitment with with devin neal or lifelong friend so you know, you think about Devin Neal, Kevin, and as great as he is on the football field, turns out he's an also an excellent recruiter. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Zeke Mayo back to come back to town. So Zeke Mayo commits to Kansas as well. And when you think about the other problem that you alluded to earlier with this team last season was sort of that lack of three-point shooting. Zeke Mayo is the type of guy that maybe helps fill that. Uh, what was kind of your thoughts on him and Zeke Mayo joining this uh, Kansas roster? Yeah, when I covered Devin Neal's recruitment, you know, people would say all the time, you know, oh, he's going to be – such a great ambassador for Kansas. You just didn't think it would show up on the basketball side, right? You know, but 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 no, he's uh, Zeke Mayo. Did you watch him play in high school? By the way, I did watch a little bit of it. Yeah, um, I wasn't actually in Lawrence at the time when he was playing, but I, sure. I did see some of his highlights. I don't know if you saw a friend of the show, Derek Johnson. This guy's getting all sorts of shout outs. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he did a game and 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 had a video of Zeke Mayo uh, shooting a three at Allen Fieldhouse against Free State in the uh, city showdown. So Zeke Mayo already used to making big shots at Allen Fieldhouse, it seems. There you go. Yeah. No, it, it was a guy that, that felt like such a natural fit. I mean, not just because of the local ties and everything, but, you know, Dewan Harris, you know, it, you don't want him playing 40 minutes a game. Uh, and Zeke Mayo was the kind of guard that can play alongside him or in place of him. You can, you know, you can send Dewan to go get a breather when Zeke Mayo is in the game, he plays under control. He's, he's one of those sort of, you know, guys who, who's not really a point guard, but he kind of masquerades as a one and a half, I guess you would say a a combo. And and so he's somebody that can run your point guard position. It's not all that different from when Kansas had Frank Mason and Devontae Graham together, where Devontae Graham was probably a more natural point guard than he was a two, but having the two of them in there together, you know, there were a lot of advantages to it. And when Frank Mason needed to to take a seat, you felt pretty comfortable that Devontae Graham was going to be able to run your offense and, and get you into your sets and all of those things. Obviously, Zeke Mayo is a great shooter. I mean, and, and you look at the career numbers, you know, guys can make shots for a year here and there or, or whatever else. It's tough to fake being a good shooter over a three-year period, which is what, you know, Zeke has done not just from three, and I think because of the struggles Kansas has had, the first thing we look at is, you know, how this guy shoot from three, but he's a terrific free throw shooter. You know, he'll he'll be one of the best free throw shooters in the Big 12 the second that he arrives on campus. And so, you know, that that's a big part of it too. Uh, I do think it'll be interesting to see who else gets added in this whole process because Kansas is kind of getting a log jam of, of guys who can play the two and three spots. And, you know, they've got some guys that could play the one and two spots right now. When you, when you also look at El Marco Jackson being a guy that got a little bit of that work this year, I think he's probably going to take a step forward next year. I, I see him regaining his confidence this off season, you know, LeBaron Phylon coming in. I, I really like LeBaron Phylon. I think he's really good. And he's another guy that because of his size, you could play him at the two at times, although he's a, a more natural point guard. And so it'll be interesting to see how all these guys shake up. I do think it's going to be very tough to keep Zeke off the court, though, with his combination of both being able to handle the ball, run the offense, and being able to shoot like he is. Yeah, your first, your first point off the top there about DeWan Harris, to me, was the thing that jumped out the most. Yeah, When you look at what DeWan Harris did this past season, there were game, there were times where he struggled, right? And the reality is Bill Self had a comment uh, way back in, I think even December, where he basically said, hey, you know, when we're asking guys to play so many minutes, and even after the K-State game, he had mentioned, when guys don't know when they're coming out, they end up trying to, you know, 
grab an extra blow here or there on the court, you know, take a possession off here or there on the court, whatever. And I think from Dewan Harris's perspective, that really limited his effectiveness because when you think about Dewan Harris, this is a, a guy that's a Big 12 defensive player, be your caliber player. But when you're asking him to play 36 plus minutes a night, he's going to be trying to take off possessions here and there, and that really limits the thing that he's the best at, right? Which is which is playing the defense and being a great being a great uh, passer on the offense as well. So to me, I think it is clear that you want Dewan Harris closer to that 30 minutes a game mark because that allows him to go all out on defense and be that elite level defensive player. And so bringing in a guy like Zeke Mayo should really help that because now, to your point, like you said. Zeke Mayo can can take the can take the take the load off of Dewan Harris a little bit and allow him to get some more rest and allow him to be that best player that we know he could be, which is literally an all Big Twelve caliber defender, Big Twelve defensive player of the year caliber defender, because we we've seen him do that in the past. That that's such a great point, and I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that I think was so different about Dewan this year, people look at the at the rim percentages and things like that. I didn't think he was anywhere near the same level defender that he was the year before. And some of it, I I think, was probably fatigue, like you're talking about. Another part of it was they needed him to play. And so him being aggressive and knowing that could lead to fouls that then forced him to sit down, you know, that really put would put Kansas in a tough spot. And so maybe you see him, you know, like you said, you hate to say guys take possessions off, but it is the sort of thing where maybe you're not quite as 100% you know, up in a guy's chest the way that you would normally be because you don't want that whistle because you know it would hurt your team so much for you to go out. And so not just having somebody that can give him a breather, but also feeling like, hey, I can I can defend at a really high level and it's going to be the sort of thing where if I get into foul trouble, they they've got answers there. They've got guys who can play for me. I think that part's gonna really help him defensively. I did think Dewan started playing a lot better defensively down the stretch. You know, it, it started, what was it? Was it maybe the K-State loss in Manhattan where you started to notice him play? It was somewhere around there where you started to see the defense ramp up a little bit, but he wasn't that guy all season long. And even then, you know, he had to be kind of careful with fouls, with energy, with all of those different things. With not just Mayo, but with Phylon coming in as well, another year for El Marco Jackson. Like you said, you know, Dewan gets to get down to that more coveted sort of 30-minute-a-game level. But even then, if he has a game where he has foul trouble and he plays 25 minutes, 23 minutes, you're not necessarily as devastated as you would have been before these additions. Yeah, and that's where I think Zeke Mayo certainly comes in, is that he can play that one position and, and, and be that guy that can run the offense a little bit. And also, again, he's a guy that is not afraid to shoot the three and, and has hit it at a high percentage, right? And obviously, ding, 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 that's a big box you're trying to check this offseason if you're KU because of, that's been one of, that was one of the main issues that you really had. And so he's a guy that's certainly, certainly you say, all right, there we go. We got a, shoot, we got a shooter covered, uh, which is great because certainly Kansas, you're going to need that, right? When you look at what happened last season with KU, that was a big part of where they ran into problems is nobody was really a real threat from the outside. That allowed teams to really look at Hunter Dickinson and say, okay, we take away Hunter Dickinson, and now that's going to take away a lot of your offense. And on top of that, if Kansas wasn't able to run successful sets, there wasn't a guy that could get any open shots. Zeke Mayo maybe can do that as well. Yeah, and I, I think when you look at both he and A.J. Storr, who you know will be the next guy that, that we talk about, you know, they were guys that, that faced a lot of challenges because they were the star players for their team. And, you know, stepping into to different roles a little bit here, they're not maybe going to have to have as much usage. They're going to be able to be a little bit more efficient and, and things like that. You know, Zeke Mayo probably had to work pretty hard to get an open shot at, at South Dakota State. It might not be the same thing at, at Kansas with both the table-setting point guard that he's going to play next to a lot of the time but also the way that Hunter Dickinson passes out of the post. And if people try to to hop in on him, you know, Zeke Mayo could find himself getting more quote-unquote warm-up jumpers than he's had in his entire career. And, and so, you know, even even though, you know, he averaged 18 points a game this year or, or whatever it was, and I think that going to Kansas, he's not going to be asked to do that much. And so he's got a chance to be a really effective, efficient player because he's not going to be – the number one name on, you know, everybody's game plan where they say, Hey, we've got to slow down this guy to win. 
Well, you touched on him right there just at the at the beginning of that point. AJ Store, the latest addition for KU out of the transfer portal. You think about the announcement from Johnny Furphy declaring for the NBA draft. You had the comments from Bill Self at the end of season banquet of, hey, it's not public yet, but we have a good idea of what some of our guys are going to be doing. Example, Johnny Furphy ends up declaring. Feels like that was something that was maybe already kind of known with, internally within KU. And then on the heels of that, the Jayhawks go out and get AJ Store. Feels like that's, okay, it makes sense. Furphy's going to be gone. You need to bring in another guy that can be a wing type. Uh, AJ Store, an extremely dynamic player at Wisconsin, a, a really explosive offensive player, a guy that can do a lot in transition. His three point numbers weren't as good as a sophomore at, as, at Wisconsin as they were when he was at St. John's to begin his career. But uh, this guy seems like he can be somebody who can come in and be a real explosive scorer, whether he's starting or if he ends up possibly coming off the bench. Feels like this is another one where KU's got a guy that can go out and get points in a hurry. Yeah, if if you average 17 points a game at a place like Wisconsin with the tempo that they play at and everything, you know, that's that's like averaging 20 points a game somewhere else. And even beyond that, averaging 17 points a game in the Big Ten is is pretty impressive. And, you know, like you said, his, his shooting percentage, I think some of that, you know, he had to take some, some difficult shots and, and things like that at times that maybe he won't have to do quite as, as much at, at Kansas. It's not that I don't expect him to start at Kansas, but at Wisconsin, you know, he was using almost a third of their possessions when he was on the court. He's not going to have to do that now. Even if he's playing a star role, he's not going to have to, you know, carry that sort of load anymore. I think the interesting thing about Store to me is the fact that it really adds a lot of interest to the Furphy sweepstakes, right? Because Furphy has kept his eligibility open. And Store is a guy that you can see as sort of a like for like Furphy replacement, you know, in terms of he's a bigger wing, you know, being six foot seven, over 200 pounds, a guy that can play the four at times if you really wanted him to in that kind of lineup. But at the same time, he's somebody that can play with Furphy too if Furphy did decide to come back. And, you know, for those who haven't seen the announcement or whatever, Furphy did say he's declaring for the NBA draft while maintaining his college eligibility it feels like whenever self wants those guys back they they wind up they wind up making a a 12th hour decision or or whatever and 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 coming back but you know i I think store gives you furphy cover which is great but at the same time i think he's also somebody that you could see playing alongside furphy as well and, and and finding a lot of success there too yeah, yeah, and that's what jumps out to me with Store is is that offense, right? Uh, a guy that, as you said, a very high usage rate at Wisconsin, and listen, put up big numbers. You know, you think about they have people that maybe are skeptical of like after what happened with Nick Timberlake, where he comes from Towson at a, a lower level school and ends up struggling a bit. AJ Store has put up big numbers against high major opponents in the Big Ten. So he's this is not a guy that's going to be shying away from scoring in, in a league like the Big Twelve. You look at some of the games where he had. You know, 24 against Illinois, 20 against Purdue, had a big game against Michigan State also. I mean, these are high-level programs, some of those programs that made deep runs in the NCAA tournament. So that's what kind of jumped out to me is like, this is a guy that's a bona fide scorer that is not going to come in and be afraid to score at this level. Uh, So that's really what jumped out to me. But the one thing about Storr, I do have a little bit of concern about Kevin, is circling back that defense question. He's not necessarily known as for being the best defender. You wonder if that might limit him at all. Uh, in terms of uh, his his play at Kansas, but I don't know. Yeah, and, and it's a, it's an interesting thing because you start going up and down that lineup, right? And you know, Dewan Harris obviously is capable of being Big Twelve Defensive Player of the Year because he was Big Twelve <laughs> Defensive Player of the Year. But you start looking at, at some of those other pieces. You know, Zeke Mayo, not necessarily known for for his defense. You know, Kugel Store, not necessarily known. For their defense, Furphy, for that matter, I, I thought he tried on defense. I thought he had some struggles on that end as well. There's not necessarily a, a Kevin McCuller there uh, where you you look at it and you say this is a great two way player or whatever else. And in fairness, McCuller came in with a reputation for being really good defensively and maybe not being as much of a finished product on the offensive end. Hunter Dickinson struggled defensively this year, and so. You start looking at it and you start wondering, okay, you know, where's where's this going to come from? You know, KJ Adams has had, you know, sort of bits and 
or bits and bursts of being a really good defender. It hasn't always come across, you know, but at the same time, it, it it's tough being where he's been at because if he's playing at the four with Kansas switching everything, he's having to switch onto really small guards. And it's tough to, it's tough to cover that when he's playing at the five, he was constantly having to defend guys that he gave up a lot of size to. And so I, I do think that, you know, finding the right defensive group with all of this, that could be what decides kind of who's playing and who isn't. And if you're if you're somebody like an El Marco Jackson and you're looking at these transfers and you're saying, gosh, I, I'm not sure where in there the minutes are going to come or, or whatever else, if El Marco Jackson takes a step forward offensively and defends at a high level, you know, Bill Self might make sure a guy like that sees the court. And, and so I, I think that that's one of sort of the pathways to playing time. And quite frankly, that's one of the things that even if Kansas adds one of these other guys or, or two of these other guys, that could be what separates a really crowded wing group is who Bill Self trusts to defend as well as score because all these guys can score. Yeah, to your point, KU might not be done in the transfer portal, like you said. They might be looking to add more. And that kind of leads me into something I wanted to get your take on, which is KU still has to technically give up one extra scholarship as part of the IERP stuff. One, or your one scholarship over the next two years. I, I kind of got the sense, or I thought the general idea was for sure just give it up this year, 12 this year. That way you can just kind of put the whole thing behind you. But with some of the comments Bill Self made at the, at the end of season banquet for KU basketball and now kind of with their activity in the transfer portal, I start to wonder if this is in a situation where Bill Self is sitting back and saying, hey, if I have the opportunity to have a roster of 13 guys that I can use, why not go for it this year? So I'm just curious. I mean, did you get the sense maybe that it was going to be 12 and now are you getting this idea of, okay, maybe actually if if there's an opportunity for you to go all in this year with 13, they may do it? You know, great minds think alike and sometimes we do too. Um, and, 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 and it's uh, it's one of the it's one of those things that that was the exact thought line that I had was, hey, it, it's going to be twelve this year. Get it out of the way, you know, move on with your life, basically. But I think when you look at and it, it's tough with the portal, it's so tough to draw lines out, you know, two years from now and have a real idea what your roster is like. But that's also part of this, too, is if you feel like this is your shot, you know, you bring back a a pretty good core, you're adding these guys in. If you're looking at it and saying, hey, I I think this is the year, then you do put that scholarship thing off another year. Because the year after now, Hunter Dickinson won't have any eligibility remaining. Dewan Harris will be gone. K.J. Adams will be gone. And and that's not to say that they won't have some of these other guys potentially coming back like Storer or Kugel or, or, or whoever. But at the same time, I think you do look at it as, you know, this is your shot, you know, and, and basically damn the torpedoes this year and, and say you, you don't want to come up short because you're a guy or two short. And, and so I do think if you feel like, hey, this – the, this is the opportunity this year that maybe you do push that scholarship off for for one more year because you feel like you have a chance at a national title this year. Yeah, I mean, like you said, with with Hunter Dickinson, Dewan Harris, and KJ Adams all probably going to be moving on after the season. We talked about earlier in the show that is your core that you have this year. So, right, if you have the chance to put those three guys in a position to go win a national other national championship, which is the goal of Kansas every year. Yeah, maybe you do go ahead and say, hey, if we need that extra guy, let's bring it in. Or maybe we say, hey, we're going to recruit to 12, and then if Johnny Furby comes back, there's our 13th, right? And that, that would be a, a fantastic addition. You know, so it, it is an interesting thought because, yeah, I think even, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it, that probably was more of a conversation of, well, no, let's just go ahead and stick with 12 this year and, you know, get rid of the IRP, be done with that, and move forward. But uh, I think it, it has kind of opened things up to an interesting conversation about, the roster and the state of the roster right now heading in and how do you get into this upcoming season? Well, and I think too, it depends on who that guy is. I mean, I'm not saying they won't fill all 13 regardless, because I, I think that that seems to be the way that they're aiming. But you look at a guy like a Kobe Brea, you know, being potentially that, that final transfer that gets you to, to 13, he's maybe the best shooter in the entire country. And, and so the ability to add a guy like that 
you know, who's who has a, such a specific role and such a specific strength that he can help you with. Uh, that's something that one you'd like to have, but two, you don't want that guy going somebody somewhere else and being on a, a team that you're facing for the national title. The last thing you want is, you know, UConn getting a 50% three point shooter and then going up against UConn in the elite eight or final four. And, and you know, that that guy hits the shots that that kind of decides your season, and so I do think it makes sense to to go ahead and fill that spot anyway. But I think that if you're looking at some of the guys that they're looking at potentially filling that spot with, that makes a lot of sense too. You know, one thing I think is clear: Bill Self is on a warpath, Kevin. Yeah, he's on a warpath. He's going scorched earth. He is looking to make sure that this Kansas team coming into 2024 is loaded and deep and ready to make another push to get back to a deep run in the NCAA tournament, winning the Big 12, and obviously the end goal, cutting the nets down. I mean, that that's really what it's all about if you're at Kansas. And listen, this is a team in KU that they haven't, besides the 2022 National Championship run, they haven't made it out of the first weekend in, what, five years now? So, you know, they'd love to get it back to the Sweet 16, get back even further and get back to, uh, to cut the nets down. Yeah, and I think he, even beyond all of that, you know, it, it's one of those things where, Bill Self doesn't have, you know, quote unquote failure a whole lot. And so he doesn't have to diagnose failure a whole lot. But I think that coming off the 2023 season where he had the health issues and then coming into 2024 and everything kind of falling apart. I mean, I, I know people blame sort of this thing or that thing. You know, most typically it's the McCullough injury. But I mean, you could check off a laundry list of of all of the things that that went wrong. Arterio Morris never suited up. You know, Kevin McCuller had the injuries. Nick Timberlake, a guy who had a really good shooting resume, you know, winds up really struggling. He did shoot well in, in the NCAA tournament, which I guess that's that's why he got him. And, and so he, he didn't do it all season long, but, you know, he, he did do it with, when it mattered at, at the end. And then El Marco Jackson being a McDonald's All-American that a lot of people were projecting as a lottery pick you know, kind of loses his confidence and, and really struggles. And so all of those different things went wrong in a season where I think self was, I don't want to say looking to atone or whatever after the health stuff, but now it's been two years where Bill Self hasn't had a, a chance to make a deep run in an NCAA tournament. And so I really do think, you know, he's he's loaded for bear on this one. I, I think that he, he's looking to compile an absolutely stacked roster and, you know, coaches are, are fans of saying that the players will decide themselves basically who plays it and who doesn't. And, and I think that that level of competition and that ability for all of these guys to push each other is something that probably really appeals to Bill Self too. He is Kevin Flaherty. I'm Nick Springer. This is the Pay Heat Podcast. And if you want more great analysis, be sure to subscribe we had you covered on all things happening KU on the basketball side, on football side, and more. So subscribe. Be sure to subscribe on the Kansas City Sports Network, whether you're listening or watching our beautiful faces on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening to our first episode of Pay Heat, and be sure to subscribe for more on your way. Kevin, appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot.